Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this day with Quimper Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, whomever you love, and whatever your faith tradition, you are welcome here. My name is Kathy Stevenson, and I'm a member here at QUF. I'd like to begin this service by acknowledging that the water, land, and shorelines here in Port Townsend are the traditional territory of the Sklalem and Chimicum peoples. We honor and acknowledge our indigenous members and neighbors and vow to help restore and sustain their homelands. As we call in our time together, let us settle, settle our mind and calm our hearts with the ringing of our chime. It is good to be together. I'd like to welcome current and former QUF singers now as they lead us down memory lane with a Zoom rendition of hymn 315, This Old World, verses 1 and 4. Thank you, Zoom Ensemble, that was beautiful. Please join me now in our chalice lighting words. They were written by Tracy Bleakney. This chalice burns with twin flames. The first flame burns for those who seek and defend the right to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning so that each person may live according to conscience in a democratically elected society. The second flame burns for the defenders of freedom, working against those who would impose their own religious beliefs on others through intimidation or legislation. May we tend this fire always, ever vigilant and courageous in the struggle for freedom and justice for all. Our opening words today are the words of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The decision whether or not to bear a child is central to a woman's life, to her well-being and dignity. When the government controls that decision for her, she is being, being treated as less than a full adult human responsible for her own choices. Thank you, Notorious RBG. I would now like to acknowledge and welcome those of you who are visiting us this morning. If you are online with us, you are invited to say hello in the comment section and tell us your name and where you're from. The chat se section can be found below or on the right side of the video when it's out of full screen. If you are attending in person, introduce yourself to your neighbors after the service and enjoy social time in our lovely garden. Either way, we're glad you're here. Thank you for coming. We will now receive the offering, which today goes to support our programming, staff, and buildings here at QUF. If you'd like to donate today, you have three options. Text the amount you'd like to give to the number now showing at the bottom of the screen. Go to our website, quuf.org, and click on the giving link, or simply mail a check to QUF. Just remember to put offering in the memo line. We will now gratefully receive your offering as we listen to our local truly talented artist, Art Price, sing I'll Rise Up by Andra Day. Okay. 
when you're broken down and tired Oh, of living life on the merry-go-round And you can't seem to find the fighter But I see it in you And we're gonna walk this out And move mountains We're gonna walk this out And move mountains We're gonna walk this out And I'll rise up Rise like the day And I'll rise up Rise unafraid And I'll rise up And I'll do it a thousand times again And I'll rise up Rise like a wave And I'll rise up Oh, in spite of the ache And I'll rise up And do it a thousand times again For you For you When the silence isn't quiet Oh, and it feels like it's getting hard to breathe And I know you feel like dying Oh, but I promise, I promise we're gonna bring the world to its feet And move Mountains, we're gonna bring the world to its feet. And I'll rise up, rise like the day, and I'll rise up, I'll rise unafraid, and I'll rise up, and I'll do it a thousand times for you. Oh, All we need is hope, and for that we have each other, and for that we have e each other, and we'll rise, and we'll rise, we will rise, we will rise, we will rise, and I'll rise up. Rise like the day and I'll rise up Oh, in spite of that ache and I'll rise up And I'll do it a thousand times again And we will rise up Rise like a wave and we'll rise up Oh, in spite of that ache And we'll rise up Do it a thousand times again For Thank you, Art. That was beautiful. We will now share our joys and sorrows, recognizing that our personal joys and sorrows are only a fragment of the joys and sorrows of the larger community of life. And thus, we place this first stone, thinking in particular of the needs of women and their reproductive health and for those who minister to their needs. And we light a candle for Doug and Pat Rogers, who celebrate their 55th anniversary on Friday, August 26th. Congratulations, Pat and Doug. We light a candle in thanksgiving for the life of Jim Oakland. We give thanks for the work that he gave to our education programs here at QUF. We send a heartfelt condolence to his family.
And now we place a final stone, holding in our hearts the joys and sorrows I've just shared, but also thinking of the joys and sorrows among us that are unexpressed, but of no less importance. I invite you now into a moment of silence. From Why the Right to Abortion Matters for Every Person by Sophia Bush. Quote, the emotions I feel, rage, fear, pain, frustration, sadness, empathy, are all consuming as I, along with millions of you, grapple with the enormity of the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which for the last 50 years has protected our fundamental right to abortion care and to self-determination. It's infuriating to watch lawmakers tune out the cries of medical professionals and to see women treated in the halls of government that purports to be founded on liberty and justice for all as less than, as though their needs and their lives don't matter. And it is deeply painful to see people consigned, legislated, to suffering. Our right to reproductive choice is fundamental to our democracy, so much that one of the societal changes that signifies a backsliding democracy, one of the surefire things that happens anywhere when equality is being chipped away, is the rollback of the rights of women, and particularly those relating to bodily autonomy. Without reproductive choice, we have no autonomy. End quote. In the words of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the decision whether or not to bear a child is central to a woman's life, to her well-being and dignity. When the government controls that decision for her, she is being treated as less than a full adult human responsible for her own choices. Our special music today is I Am Willing by the great Holly Near. Change. 
It dishonors those who go before us. So lift me up to the light of Prior to moving to Port Townsend, Susan was a member of the UU community in Cambria, California for nine years. Once walking into that UU church, Susan, a non-churchgoer, knew she had found her people. When she returned to Washington last October, settling in Port Townsend, one criteria was that there had to be a UU in the community. Susan has three small grandchildren, granddaughters in Seattle, and a grandson in Mexico. Susan? I gave a sermon at the UUCC in Cambria, California, in honor of the 43rd anniversary of the passing of Roe v. Wade. That was January of 2016, just six years ago. At that time, I cautioned about how the right to privacy and abortion was being chipped away in our country, as it has been ever since the passage of Roe. Friday, June 24th, 2022 changed everything. Life as we had come to know it in a free country changed when the U.S. Supreme Court essentially ruled that women and childbearing people are now second-class citizens without the right to privacy, self-determination, bodily autonomy, and safe medical procedures. They killed Roe v. Wade with the stroke of a pen and took this country back 50 years in an instant. The fact is that prior to this recent decision, abortion was illegal in our country for a block of time lasting about 75 years. Prior to that, abortions occurred regularly and without national debate. They were part of women's lives. Abortion and contraceptives were legal before the Civil War. Reproductive health care was provided by female midwives made up, <clears throat> excuse me, made up of about 50% black women, with the remainder split between indigenous women and white women. Medicine as a profession was taking root in Europe and then spread to the U.S., Women were systematically and deliberately being excluded from universities and from providing health care. And one of the challenges was how to convince nice women to allow men into the arena of what we now call gynecology. The medical profession became actively engaged in the elimination of female healers, which was done mostly by discrediting women and their knowledge. A part of this discrediting was comprised of racist and misogynistic smears designed for political persuasion so as to achieve legal reform. Black midwives were described as unhygienic, barbaric, ineffective, non-scientific, and unprofessional. At the root of these stereotypes were explicit efforts to destroy midwifery and promote white supremacy. Dr. Joseph DeLee, a preeminent 20th century obstetrician and a fervent opponent to midwifery, stated in a much quoted 1915 speech entitled Progress Toward Ideal Obstetrics and said, the midwife is a relic of barbarism. In civilized countries, the midwife is wrong, has always been wrong. The midwife has been a drag on the progress of the science and art of obstetrics. Her existence stunts the one and degrades the other. For many centuries, she perverted obstetrics from obtaining, obtaining any standing at all among the science of medicine. Even after midwifery was practiced by some of the most brilliant men in the profession, such practice was held opprobrious and degraded. Gynecologists explicitly revealed their motivations in undermining midwifery. They desired financial gains, recognition, and a monopoly. 
Dr. Lee also wrote a 1916 article published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Disease of Women and Children. There is a high art in obstetrics and that it must pay as well as for surgery. I will not admit that this is a sordid impulse. It is only common justice to labor, self-sacrifice, and skill. They believe that men should be paid, but not women, and particularly not black women. Abortion and reproductive care was a part of midwifery practice. As an effort to discredit midwives, the practice of abortion was demonized as an abomination. I'd like to read a brief history of abortion from Our Bodies, Ourselves, a classic resource book that women of all ages still turn to for information about every aspect of their well-being. Over several centuries and in different cultures, there's a rich history of women helping each other to abort. Until the late 1800s, women healers in Western Europe and the U.S. provided abortions and trained other women to do so without legal prohibitions. The state didn't prohibit abortion until the 19th century, nor did the church lead in this new repression. In 1803, Britain first passed anti-abortion laws, which then became stricter throughout the century. The U.S. followed as individual states began to outlaw abortion. By 1880, most abortions were illegal in the U.S., except those necessary to save the life of the woman. But the tradition of women's rights to early abortion was rooted in U.S. society by then. Abortionists continued to practice openly and with public support, and juries refused to convict them. Abortion became a crime and a sin for several reasons. A trend of humanitarian reform in the mid-19th century broadened liberal support for criminalization because at the time abortion was a dangerous procedure done with crude methods, few antiseptics, and high mortality rates. But this alone cannot explain the attack on abortion. For instance, other risky surgical techniques were considered necessary for people's health and welfare and were not prohibited. Protecting women from the dangers of abortion was actually meant to control them and restrict them to their traditional childbearing role. Anti-abortion legislation was part of an anti-feminist backlash to the growing movements for suffrage, voluntary motherhood, and other women's rights in the 19th century. At the same time, male doctors were tightening their control over the medical profession. Doctors considered midwives who attended births and performed abortions as part of their regular practice a threat to their own economic and social power. The medical establishment actively took up the anti-abortion cause in the second half of the 19th century as part of its effort to eliminate midwives. Finally, with the declining birth rate among whites in the late 1800s, the U.S. government and the eugenics movement warned against the danger of race suicide and urged white, native-born women to reproduce. Budding industrial capitalism relied on women to be unpaid household workers, low-paid menial workers, reproducers, and socializers of the next generation of workers. Without legal abortion, women found it more difficult to resist the limitations of these roles. I wanted to provide this background because this concept and the foundation of anti the anti-abortion movement is something that, as a young 34-year-old, I had never considered or even thought about. It is my guess that most people are unaware that the anti-abortion anti -abortion movement is rooted in white supremacy, the control of women, and the advancement of a male-dominated medical profession. I was hired to manage the Feminist Women's Health Center in Redding, California in 1985. I arrived there with a background in banking, one year as a law enforcement clerk at the Shasta County Jail, and my political innocence completely intact. I was able to convince the clinic administrators that I could apply my background in management and my natural ability to write to any environment, including medicine and abortion. 
After I leaped up on my soapbox and told them how much I believed in a woman's right to choose, they decided to take a chance and they hired me. At that time in my life, I was completely and deliberately non-political and incredibly naive about what was taking place in the political world, and in particular, the abortion world. I knew that I would be dealing with picketers and anti-choice people, but I honestly believed that they only needed to be educated in order to understand the significance and importance for women of keeping abortion safe and legal. I would like to point out that my frame of reference at this time included women only, as the transgender movement was way out of the mainstream. Again, this was 1985. As a result of my belief, one of the first things I did was to call a press conference at the clinic. I had written a heartfelt and passionate letter to the protesters, explaining to them the emotional and detrimental effect their presence and actions of name calling and yelling epithets had on the women who were coming in seeking services. They would yell at women, sometimes with bullhorns, to shame them, to belittle them, and humiliate them so they would not come into the clinic. It was verbal abuse and bullying at its finest. In my innocence, in being new to the abortion rights movement, I thought that the picketers just didn't understand the unnecessary and cruel burden their actions were inflicting on women. I thought that if only they knew the hurt and emotional damage they were creating in an already difficult time for these women, that they would have an aha moment and stop doing what they were doing. I believed they would suddenly have compassion for the women coming into the clinic and would want to support them rather than judge, belittle, humiliate, and shame them. So we held a press conference. Copies of the letter I had written were handed to each picketer who was there that day while the press took pictures. Local TV stations and the local newspaper interviewed me. With nothing but a strong belief and a well-written, heartfelt letter, I innocently and unknowingly catapulted myself into the middle of the abortion battle in Redding, California. The verbal retaliation I received from the anti-abortion folks was such a shock. It didn't take long for me to begin to understand that the people outside the clinic didn't see the woman in the picture as relevant. They claimed to only see a baby and frame the debate this way. It was not so obvious that this was really a way to keep women in their place. They did not give credit to any woman for having any intelligence. They had no compassion for the woman's situation at all. Not for her inability to care for a child, for her autonomy, and the ability to know what was right, the right decision for her own life in her own situation. There was a strong element of judgment and punishment. If you become pregnant and are not married, then you need to be punished for having sex by being forced into motherhood. If you become pregnant and are married, then you must have a child, regardless of the circumstances of your marriage and family. It is all very black and white. The women and their situations were insignificant and non-existent. The women were just incubators with no inherent rights, no voice, and certainly no ability to know what was best for them. For myself, I learned quickly that it was not mine to decide if a woman's reason to terminate was good enough. Her reasons are her reasons, actually none of my business. Again, not mine to judge. If you think that all the way through, I realized, did I want to be the one to stand in the doorway of the clinic and decide for each woman who came in whether or not her reason was valid? Was I willing to refuse services based on my personal opinion or beliefs and sentence that woman to go home and have a child she was unable to care for, did not want, or would she possibly go home and attempt to perform her own abortion? I learned to trust women completely, to provide them with neutral information and step out of the way as they made their own decisions. Women know what is best in their own situation, period. It took me a while longer to realize that the great majority of picketers were men. 
there were surprisingly few women. I came to realize that these were men who were threatened by a woman having the power to control her own life. If these men could not control women and force them to be dependent on them, they felt endangered. They feared feminists and accused us of hating men, of being witches, and of being lesbians, as if that were somehow evil. But the knowing and understanding I took away from this was, if a woman can control her own reproduction, she has the freedom to control her own life. It's not about babies. It never was. That was a facade. It's about women and their freedom. It's about women's lives. This was a pretty radical thought back then. For many, many years, I witnessed and experienced what childbearing people go through when they find themselves carrying an unwanted pregnancy. Perhaps it's financial. Perhaps they are 10 years old and molested by a family member. Maybe they're in an abusive relationship. Perhaps they already have four children and no partner. Perhaps they're 56 years old. There are a multitude of reasons, more than you can imagine, as unique as each person, for which childbearing, excuse me, for which childbearing people decide to choose abortion. For some people, abortion is a clear decision and they have absolutely no doubt about which course to take. For the majority of people, there is a process. They doubt themselves. They beat up on themselves. They are angry and judge themselves for being stupid. Perhaps they've already had an abortion and somehow having another makes them a worse person. They wonder, am I careless? Is this God's will? Perhaps they consider themselves pro-life and may even pick it outside of a clinic. Now here they are, seriously considering doing what they have always claimed was murder. And yes, those people I've just described do have abortions. Then strangely enough, they show up on the picket line again the following week. They are able to rationalize that they will be forgiven, but they continue to judge all other people who come to have abortions. Most people dig deeply into themselves when they are contemplating abortion. It's a process, not a decision that is ever entered into lightly. It is not about whether or not their prom dress will fit in three weeks. It is not a cavalier decision. It is a time of soul searching about each person's personal belief system, their faith or spirituality, their life situation, their support network, their options, their family, and their life. And when women would make their appointments and come into the clinic, the vast majority had already made their decision, including who they needed to involve in that decision. They are not looking for anyone, not inside or outside of the clinic, to give them advice or tell them what they need to do. Being a feminist clinic, we never asked a woman to justify her decision to us. We did ask if she was firm in her decision. That was to verify that she was not being coerced. We provided neutral, factual information, and we supported each and every woman to make her own decision, whatever the decision was, and we helped her to get whatever she needed based on that decision, be it adoption referrals and information, prenatal care referrals, or abortion services. We believed in and trusted women to know what they needed in their own personal circumstances and situation. Women and pregnant people know. They absolutely know. Roe v. Wade became the law of the land on, on January 22, 1973, protecting the right to choose and at long last granting bodily autonomy for more than half of the U.S. population. Abortion was safe and legal in this country for 49 years, five months, and two days. Almost immediately, that right was under attack. On June 24th of this year, after almost 50 years of chipping away at it, the Supreme Court completely overturned Roe v. Wade. When I heard the news, I was all at once overcome with despair and outrage. 
Even with the leaked decision and knowing it was coming, I was horrified that it actually happened. In my head, I was screaming. I felt physically ill. I wept and I raged. I thought of the battle I had dedicated my life to for 25 years. I thought of my daughters, of my granddaughters, and the assault on their reproductive freedom. I thought of all of the women who had passed through the doors of our clinics, seeking and receiving safe medical services, and I had a deep dread for the future of all childbearing people in this country. For me, this all comes back to each individual and their right to control their own destiny. When a person cannot manage their own fertility, they are prohibited from managing their own life. For these people, any plans, dreams, aspirations, responsibilities, or commitments, no matter how important, have a great big contingency clause built in that says, unless or until I get pregnant, in which case all bets are off. Think of any professional woman or childbearing person you know. They wouldn't be in that role if they hadn't been able to time and control their childbearing. Think of any young person you know who imagines becoming a professional. They won't get there unless they have an effective, reliable means to manage their fertility. This is about recognizing and respecting the inherent worth and dignity of every person, the first UU principle. It is about our second principle, justice, equality, and compassion in human relations. I believe there is a piece of this in each of our seven UU principles. In 1963, prior to Roe v. Wade, the UUA passed a general resolution to support the reform of abortion statutes. In 1975, the UUA passed a general resolution supporting the right to abortion. The general resolution of 1987 reaffir reaffirmed its historic position supporting the right to choose contraception and abortion as legitimate aspects to the right of privacy. In 1993, there was yet another general resolution passed in support of reproductive freedom. In the 2015 Statement of Conscience, UUA has expanded the phrase reproductive rights to reproductive justice and includes four principles. On June 24, 2022, the UUA President, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, issued a statement reaffirming the UUA's position on abortion. She concluded by saying, quote, our faith calls us to advocate on behalf of all those who, who need ready access to safe, legal abortion care whenever and wherever they need it. We will not rest until that reality is true across the country. I urge lawmakers, elected officials, and leaders in public life across the country to take action for gender and health care equity for all." End quote. In the end, I find myself becoming encouraged because with this attempt to destroy reproductive freedom, the rights of women, and the right to privacy for all, people all over this country are speaking out, and they are angry. They're speaking out loudly. Take a look at the angry voters of Kansas who just loudly proclaimed their disagreement with the Supreme Court decision. Doctors are publicly reporting travesties that this ruling has caused, how women are suffering and having to travel across state lines when their lives are at risk. I watch as we are coming together in ground swells to say, no, we will not go back. Things are changing day by day since this ruling and every day I hear and I'm gladdened by the pushback. This is not the fight it was back in the day when it was an uphill battle to make and keep abortion rights legal. This is the fight to keep freedoms that people have enjoyed for the last almost 50 years to control their own lives. I can only feel optimistic about where we are heading now because we have the conviction, the momentum, and the determination on our side bringing us together. In the words of Margaret Sanger, no woman can call herself free who does not control her own body. 
No woman can call herself free until she can choose consciously whether or not she will be a mother. Our closing hymn today is number six, Just As Long As I Have Breath, sung by the Quimper Quartet. Just as long as I have breath, I must answer yes just to life. Though with pain I made my way, still with hope I meet each day. If they ask what I did well, tell them I said yes to life. Just as long as fish and Thank you, Sarah, Pat, Doug, and Al. Before we extinguish our chalice, I want to remind you that Case Kolf will be our guest speaker next Sunday. He will be preaching on secular health care in Jefferson County. I hope you can join us. And now let us join voices in our chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish our flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, the fire of commitment, or the power of transformation, these we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And now we'll turn our attention to musicians around the world playing for change with our postlude, Bob Marley's Get Up, Stand Up.
got to get up, up. stand up. Never give up the fight.